Hi there, I'm Tom Field, Senior Vice President of Editorial with Information Security Media Group. I want to welcome you to our latest cybersecurity leadership panel. This is where CISOs and CEOs make ROI. Our discussion topic today is preserving data privacy and an expanding universe of emerging technology. And to get started, I want to immediately introduce you to our panel today. From the CEO community, we have Anoop Ghosh, CEO of Fidelis Cybersecurity. Abdul Kader, he's the CEO of Very Good Security. From the CISO community, please welcome Rebecca Wynn, CISO with 247.ai. Rebecca? Pleasure to be here. And Joey Johnson is a CISO with Premise Health. Joey, thanks so much for joining us today. First topic I want to discuss is critical information assets. Now, as this year winds down, the importance of data, the power of being an insights-driven enterprise are increasing the amount of damage that data breaches can cause. And yet, most CISOs don't know where their critical assets reside necessarily, or even how to identify them. So the first question I have, Rebecca, I'd love to toss this to you and get input from others as well. With 5G on the horizon, what are going to be the top issues in identifying, protecting, and defending against attacks across a dramatically expanded threat landscape? So one of the things that you mentioned earlier is about um, email. Phishing attempts, especially this time of year, is really on a rampant increase in going into national elections. And one thing that companies should do is they should partner with someone like Microsoft, um, who they can also go ahead and partner and use their data loss prevention product that is free um, right now for the majority of people who are using it. And you should go ahead and partner with that. And that's how you can go ahead and see if someone is actually trying to send out you know, health information or credit card information or corporate sensitive information, you know, take advantage of the bigger companies that you might already be using that have free project products already in there. And then layer on something like Proofpoint. Proofpoint, you can look at the top layer architecture for you. You can take the middle layer who spends 25 to 35 cents on every single dollar on research so you don't have to. And very much so you can meet with them every single week or every single month to see what's actually going on, not only in your sector, but other sectors. So then you can be better positioned for the future. The other thing I think is a good time, if you haven't already, is look at cloud-based DLP or a CASB, because you don't know what you don't know. Most companies out there think that they might be touching 35 SaaS providers, and you find out that there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of SaaS providers. And that's where you're going to find out you have a lot of data leakage. You also can go ahead and take a look at that and see what data is actually attempting to leave your network that you weren't even aware of and be more creative along those lines. So those are two quick things and quick wins I think you can get. And I think also that people should really use the vendors that they have and the stronger, bigger vendors up there because they want to partner with you and they'll do a lot of proof of value with you to show you that you do have those return on investments, return on efficiency by using them. You know, I, I think good security or pretty good security maybe starts with understanding what your assets are, right? Um, and there are many ways to do this. Uh, you know, one way that we like is sort of inferring uh, what your assets are based on network traffic, based on the kinds of applications and protocols that they're using. Uh, we call it cyber terrain, which is just by looking across the enterprise, understanding what assets are there, being able to classify them automatically. And then the next step, I think, is um, once we understand what our assets are, how they're being used, is inferring you know, what their vulnerabilities are. We actually take a very sort of a view from an adversary to say, OK, given that these assets are out there communicating to the net, or you know, one step removed from that, how do we, from an adversary's point of view, uh, discover the attack paths? What are the vulnerabilities? How might one get to your critical assets, which you also mentioned, right? And then I think that the third and final point I'll make uh, is, is that around data loss, right? And uh, you know, we, we consider protection of intellectual property uh, to be probably the most important function of many CISOs, we can ask Joey to weigh in on that. But you know, data being the new perimeter, so to speak, understanding where that data is, is it on-premise, is it in the cloud, is it with your SaaS providers, understanding how to uh, make sure that you can detect when that data is leaving um, your, 
your uh, assets in a way that it shouldn't. And so that these are all areas that, that we focus on uh, in addition to finding and, and responding to adversaries on the network. I definitely think um, obviously the advent of, of 5G is, is, is going to, to change a lot. Um, work from home obviously has, you know, I think the challenge really that, that, that I've seen emerge is, is a couple things. One, um, particularly for us, so we're in healthcare, we're a, we're, we're a healthcare provider, right? So we didn't just have to shift everyone home. We actually had to deal with entire workforces that weren't acclimated to being in front of a screen eight hours a day. They were engaging patients, they were engaging with each other, but it was all face-to-face, -face, right? And so you take this workforce and shift them into a completely electronic or electronic communication model, and they start using technology in ways that they hadn't before. So we had the controls there, we had the tools there, we had things like that there, but now you're having you're kind of having data patterns and, and usage cases emerge. The other thing that complicates it a little bit is that technology is so ubiquitously available to the end user. Um, you can give them really good technology, you can put really good controls around things, but and kind of like you said, you know, the, the data perimeter concept, it really is like the, it's the data perimeters and they're kind of, and they're amorphous and they're all out there. And so, you know, there are risk scenarios, even when you have really good data classification dynamics built in, um, that there is what would you might theoretically think is your intellectual property or your sensitive data or something like that, that exists in someone's brain and it makes it out onto an electronic platform that you don't really have any governance over. Um, so it makes you shift kind of the ways that you're monitoring what's happening out there, right? There are solution providers out there that are doing kind of dark web monitoring or just what, what's out there on the internet. What are your assets that you don't know about? That kind of shift to really having that broader global vision is really important. Um, because those things do land out there. And, and by the time you find out about it, it's too late. You know, horses out of the barn. The general theme that I see everybody here basically suggesting is that don't try to do it yourself, right? But partner with somebody else who's, who's more of an expert, right? And, um, but it also sounds like we're trying to shift um, the traditional ways we've operated as folks have gone on, you know, working from home or as, you know, folks are digitally transforming today, whether there's through some kind of business objectives, like the, the def, like we said, the definition of the perimeter has changed, right? And so as a result, you know, Mark Andreessen and A16Z is an investor uh, in very good security. You know, he famously said that software is eating the world and right before our eyes, this world is changing, right? So that follows that the world must change as well. Uh, the software must change as well. And so, you know, so 5G, these, the, the emergence of 5G networks, I think is going to cause very interesting threat vectors that I don't think traditional providers will have uh, addressed for. Uh, for example, I think we're going to see a much more sophisticated DDoS or federated uh, DDoS or potential uh, botnet attacks that have come from different you know, IoT devices that have bigger bandwidth that are closer to us, right? So how you know, being able to understand and detect that uh, and, and being able to rely on um, intelligence is going to be very important. Uh, the other thing that I think, you know, we, I expect to see, you know, completely different novel types of attacks, right? As we are all at home, it's going to be hard for us to, you know, one of the things that we know for sure is that information is going to get exchanged, right? And so the question becomes, will there be something similar to like poisoning information exchange, right? And so, you know, and I, I like to call this, fake news for emerging cooperative based networks, right? Will you be able to make decisions based off of, you know, bad data? And, you know, as, as we have and deploy more tools like with machine learning and AI to combat these threats, you know, integrity and confidentiality will be an even greater focus. And so, you know, I think it's not only going to come from phishing attempts, it's not going to come from training our employees, it's not going to come from the shift, but it's going to come from ways we've kind of have to recognize patterns that, you know, are malicious in nature and be able to communicate that to everybody that's working um, to be able to, you know, combat the new, you know, data perimeter, if, if you will. I mean, that's the, the real key here, right? When you go to 5G, you're going away from the traditional network into a software-based network. And the reason why we have to, be, especially with the COVID, is we need to be able to get rid of late, you know, latency in our systems, right? We're all suffering because of that. And we're all suffering that things aren't going to speed of light. A lot of us are also global. And globally, not everybody is in position very well to even be 3G, needless to say 5G. 
And so it's really pushing on, on us as we've had to ramp up and go to a workforce at home. You know, what is your IT asset management look like? What is your IT software management look like? What are you really looking at in your backbone? What is happening on, on the backbone? What's happening on those other providers? What are they really doing? Because that's one of the things is too, is we've had a lot of people say, hey, we're now into 5G. But, but you have less than 30% of the, the companies out there in the recent reports that I've just looked at, that are even positioned at all to even have an idea of what their true network looks like. And that was even before going into COVID. So how, how are we going to handle that? It's one of those things that, you know, it's good on paper that it's here, but it's not really here yet. We've had to just ramp it up to be a lot more quickly. So people say, what do we do in the meantime? You know, as we, we've mentioned here, you really need to go ahead and look at your IT asset management. What assets do you have out there? Who do you allow to even wear a smartwatch anywhere near your systems, right? Because now that is part of your network that coffee maker, right? We, we've talked about this before, those smart lamps. You better go ahead and make sure that you realize that all that kind of stuff is in your network. And when you look at people at home, have you gone ahead and, and had people take pictures of their home office? Have they had to test what's in their home office? Because you might think there's a network that is their router and maybe just their computer system and their phone. And they might have 20 different devices out there that actually part of your network or could infiltrate your network. And when you talk about major tax, that's where I think the major tax is going to come with the distributed DDoS. Again, I think you're going to go ahead and see them use Internet of Things items that people have in their homes. I'm going to go ahead and use those as, as bots to go ahead and, and take down networks. What I'm really afraid for is infrastructure, critical infrastructure, by going ahead and, and using our meters and things along those lines for us to be able to connect and then take us offline, especially going into the, the global elections that we have here for the United States. What, what does someone else think? You look at 5G, which, as you say, is going to fuel the proliferation of IoT devices, which we know are often built with only a few security controls. And that's going to enable a larger attack surface that enterprises are going to have to address. As you say, Rebecca, it's not just the router. It's not just the laptop. It's the connected devices all around the office, the Alexa, whatever it might be. And malicious actors can and will adopt technologies such as AI, machine learning, faster than security leaders can respond. So my question for the panel, and Mahmoud, I'd love for you to take this first. What is our best path to securing critical, high-value assets under this weight of enhanced attack vectors from new threats enabled by these wonderful technologies. You know, one of, one of the more interesting things, if we step back, we just have to realize like, what is the purpose of securing these critical high value assets, right? It's typically to achieve a business objective. And so we just have to balance how we adapt to these changes while accelerating these business initiatives, right? So besides deploying real time data analysis and intelligent threat feeds and cooperative sharing, we can, like you said, we expect the adversary to adopt machine learning and AI faster. And I think the landscape just needs to shift from kind of data sprawl to data minimization. And we need to re-architect the way we extract value from data without this need for data sprawl. And I, you know, I think there's something to be said with how we protect and defend our money and financial institutions today, right? We can transact and extract value from our money. And in this day and age, it's never in our possession. And so why can't we apply these same principles to these new threats that you know threaten these uh, critical high value assets? And so obviously this requires us to invest in training. This requires us to invest in, you know, limited decision-making, but I'd love to hear more of the, uh, the panel to get more of their, uh, their thoughts on this. We know, right, there's a whole lot of precedent to tell us the adversaries can adopt technology a lot faster and they have the advantage that they can fail a lot and it doesn't really affect anything, right? We, we don't have that luxury. But you're seeing organizations move a little bit more, um, some more aggressively than others, to zero trust models and other things like that because the, the traditional archetype just, just doesn't fit anymore. Um, but it is, it, it is true. I mean, like what you said, you know, I know we're looking at and, and colleagues that I talk to are, are, are looking at, hey, what are our new collaboration tools and approaches? You know, we're looking at things that are saying, you know, if, if you give people appropriate visibility into, into certain data artifacts, 
and, and you give them the ability to work with it and manipulate it there, 80% of the time, upwards of that, they don't download it. They don't need a local copy of it, right? It doesn't need to proliferate all over the place. They can use it, see it, interact with it, engage with it, and then they're done, right? And it doesn't have to sit in an inbox here and in a box share there and all over the place, which is, which is what happens today. And so, you know, I think organizations are just going to hopefully refocus a little bit better and take a more critical look at what are your crown jewels, what really does matter, and how do you control the access modalities to that a little bit better and get it more intelligent about, you know, identities and, and, and who's doing what there. But um, it's, it's not going to be for, for, for lack of, of people trying and, and, and failing in ridiculous ways. But, um, you know, and we are going to see different attack modalities. I mean, we will see, you know, smart home speakers getting hijacked in different ways and being leveraged for different purposes and stuff like that. So um, it's coming. Yeah, to, to add on to the discussion around advanced adversaries and their tactics and what can be done about it, and I, I think, Joey, you could probably be sympathetic to what I'm about to say next, which is, you know, the, the typical CISO today has purchased so many different vendors' uh, products, and uh, I, I expect there to be some rationalization that has to happen. The issue there is you have so many different silos that you're basically peering into, and the mixed metaphors, you're, you're peering through a straw into each of these silos, and, and adversaries don't care about that. They just see a, an enterprise network um, that they can move easily across. And so where, where I'm going with that is, is we need a couple of approaches that break down these silos, right? That allow us to see across the enterprise, right? Uh, and not just on endpoint and not just at the firewall, right? Um, and other network devices. So uh, what, what the approach that we're taking at Fidelis is each of these different parts of the enterprise, the cloud, the endpoint, the network device, um, and, and, and uh, just to foreshadow a little bit, even decoys that we layer on, give us visibility across the enterprise. And the, and the issue isn't that uh, we lack visibility, it's, it's how do we pull together the different telemetry into a coherent picture that's then actionable, right? And I think in the SOC today, you're overwhelmed by alert. So again, it's not telemetry is a problem. It's how do we get to the meta analysis of those alerts that tell us what the adversary is doing and even more importantly, their next move. And so we use that combination of, we call it XDR, right? As uh, Gartner is calling it, which is the ability to pull in telemetry from different sources, create this picture uh, in an enterprise-wide view and layer on decoys uh, using deception technology so that when an adversary hits a decoy, uh, which if they're scanning your network, at, they're, they're likely to do, you get advanced warning as to where your adversaries are, mapping it to a MITRE attack kill chain and say what their next boost will be. So I, I think that big picture of what's going on is probably what we need to start to get ahead of adversaries instead of always uh, chasing them from behind. Complex though, because, because I mean, so the XDR space, the sort of best of best of suite versus best of breed, I mean, it offers a lot. All that telemetry offers a lot. The challenge mm -hmm. that is that your threat landscape is way broader than your network uh, upon which you can apply telemetry to. The other challenge is, and I, I had a conversation the other day where somebody said, you know, what's the thing that, that keeps you up at night? And I said, really, it's that, the rate of technology growth and adoption is outpacing our talent pools from a security perspective, ability to protect it, right? Even like, I'll take a look, you look at IAM, right? And, and I was, we were interviewing some, some engineer folks and it was like, well, this person came from Ping but didn't know their way around Okta at all. Or, you know, it's just like, you know, even within one specific space or segment, it's like, it's very hard for them to move over just because I, I have a person who understands how to write secure code doesn't mean they understand anything about CI/CD pipeline or API security, right? And mm -hmm. so it's and and the, the the business is adopting technology at such a fast pace that our ability to kind of keep up with that and and sort of cover the whole ground uh, is is very is very difficult. I, I remember, you know, I'm a, I'm a Washington football fan, and um, years ago we had a cornerback named Fred Smoot, and he said, you know, 75% of the earth is covered by water, the rest is covered by Smoot. Well. Uh, you know, I am not about to say that I've got 75% or 25% of anything covered, right? It, it's just too fast and or it's just too much and it changes so fast. So, you know, I think that those, the, the XDR stuff is, it offers a lot, 
but we still kind of have all this stuff on the periphery that's moving so quick. The talent pool is lacking in the skill sets. What I notice is that they got so used to having things automated and especially just looking at network devices that they lost the critical thinking skills. What, what does that mean in my environment? What does the correlation mean in my environment? Should the person actually be doing, doing that action? And, and then you're having to train them really how to think again. So for the people out there who are trying to get into cybersecurity, you really got to, to be able to do that. Take all the critical thinking skills that you can. Take all the critical thinking classes you can. Keep asking yourself, what is the so what? What does it mean? What's the impact? When does something actually try to use this trimetry to go ahead and actually to run through my network? What would that mean? What would be my stop points? What would be my choke points? Because that's the other thing we have at 5G. Our choke points are gone. That's very important. Our choke points are gone, right? Because the traditional network doesn't exist anymore, right? And so the, the very, very important, uh, you know, Rebecca, you, you said it, and Joey, you, you said it as well. And so it's, it's just more about, you know, it's not about more telemetry. It's not about, you know, it's not about more monitoring. It is really more about being able to piece together the narrative, right? And I think, I think, and, and critically thinking, that's something that, I don't think so, you can train someone to critically think, you know, without a boot camp, right? Without specific dedicated training for them to be able to, um, you know, derive and deduce and and hypothesize and test very quickly, right? So we we need to be able to create an environment where we can test hypotheses quickly, so that we can prove and 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 come to resolutions faster. And that's really that's really the challenge I think for the future is going to be how do we allow our teams, you know, whether the traditional SOCs or DOCs or whoever it is that's going to be monitoring the, the usage of data today, how will they be able to hypothesize very quickly so that they can respond rapidly to perceived threats uh, and, and, and kind of understand how to extract metadata to see if it is really something to escalate or not. And I think that's going to be the challenge, I think, for the future. I just want to move on and talk a little bit about data protection and particularly third-party risk. Joey, I want to start this with you because in healthcare, you've got your business associates that you have to deal with and you've got regulators breathing down your backs on how you're dealing with them. In this environment, how do you ensure that your data is protected from unauthorized access or compromise and that your controls continue to meet regulatory requirements in dealing with these third parties? We do have to run a dedicated third-party risk management program, and, and we're providing, as I said, provider health care. So it's not just regulated there, but we're providing health care to large insurer groups, um, employer groups, sorry. That, I mean, that's our business model, right? If you're large enough to be self-insured, you want to bring your health care uh, services to you on site um, or virtually. Um, that's what we do. So our, our clients, you know, we're, we're answering to them as well. They're across finance, defense. Uh, technology, healthcare, all the regulated oil and gas, you know, energy, all the regulated sectors. So we're getting audited all the time about how we're collecting data, what we're doing with it, even if it's not our client data, which is under their scope of their controls, right? They're hitting us with their third-party risk management requirements. But then we're seeing people, treating them as patients, generating patient data, and then we have to put that out into the healthcare ecosystem, right? And so there's a balance because we can be accountable for our third parties. We can have some degree of accountability for our BAs, uh, but we we can't we can't be accountable for the security posture of the healthcare ecosystem USA, right? It's just it's just too big and expansive. But um, you know, we we do have to like I mean, it's just the the maturity point that you're at to be able to to you know monitor them really and 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 get them under some kind of program, but Honestly, what I've found is that there's not a one, a way to do it, right? For example, when you're, when we're dealing with small uh, organizations, the businesses pick them because they want to do something new and innovative and they need a partner that's going to be nimble and be creative and be able to be flexible and adapt. And, you know, it, it, we used to always joke around internally, I'd say, you know, I don't need to send them a questionnaire. Let me answer the, ask them three questions on the phone. Do you have a CISO? Do you have an InfoSec policy? Do you have a single IT security employee? The answer to those questions are no. I do not need to send you 2,000 more questions to find out what I already know, right? And so in those, we kind of said, you know, maybe the models are better being consultative for us. If we've got the, if we've got the capability, if we've got the maturity, it's probably better to say, hey, listen, we really want to do business with you but I think you're at a two and I need to get you to like an eight on a maturity scale 
And it's easier if I just help you do that and have, have you sit down with my engineers. We can run the pen test where you can we do all this stuff because then it changes the dynamic of where they're not afraid to engage with our security function for fear of losing our business. They are actually creating a partnership where we can say, hey, let us help you navigate some of these complex risk scenarios that, that are a foreign language to you, quite honestly, and build a partnership. And so then they start becoming more transparent. So that's, you know, that's kind of one way that we did it. But, you know, again, not, not one size fits all. Um, there's, there's a ton of risk out there. And even, even as we've looked, as organizations have kind of gone cloud first, it took me a lot of time to work with my GRC team and say, hey, the way that you were assessing technology risk has changed dramatically, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about, are you patching this server in this way anymore? It's not about, did you reboot these systems anymore? It's, you know, here's, here's how DevOps works, guys. Here's what's happening and here's what it means to you because the ways that you're assessing risk are completely disconnected from the way that the risk actually exists. So, you know, it, it's a constant growth process, right? I mean, take the adversary out of it. Just us managing our own mess is, is complicated. It's really gone beyond the, the old school, right? I call that old school GRC and we're all dealing with it To What is your, your cybersecurity strategy? What is your risk management strategy? And we really have to get people to think futuristic that way and get them in there. And, and we've really been trying to silo, right? So we assist those really our risk managers. Um, for the company as well. And one of the things is that when you look at, I do the same thing that Joey does, is I really want to get them on the phone because I want to see how they're thinking, how they're managing risk, how they're thinking about risk. What is your cyber strategy? I really don't like the question more. Do you have an information security policy? Yeah, here's the template I filled out five years ago, eight years ago. What is your cyber strategy? How are you positioning yourself to be able to handle 5G? Or how are you positioning yourself to handle the IoT devices on your network? How are you identifying those? getting them in a dialogue to see if they're actually strong technical and strategic CISOs. And if they're not, you know, it's a figurehead. I've done it before where someone is really like, they were really the person who, who handed out laptops, but somehow they got a CISO um, in their title. Um, and you have to be really careful about that. I think the other thing is the paradigm shift that I've seen over a number of years. It's kind of weird. Um, and we hire someone to do work for us as I'm talking about CISOs in general as a company, but then we end up being their professional services provider. You know, and I think people really need to take a look at back at those contracts and and maybe you need to be renegotiating them better. I also think that people need to really be right now looking at their cybersecurity um, liability insurance. And if you don't have some, you should have some. And if you do have some, you should be looking at all the exclusions that are in there. And even if we, you do get attacked on any of the vectors we're talking today, are you protected? And if you're not protected this way, how are you going to protect your company? So the whole vendor management, you know, it's antiquated, too. Right. It's, it's like it is a partnership and you really have to do a risk model, just like you do if you use a cloud provider. What are you responsible for? What are they responsible? What is shared between you both and really have that in place and have it as part of your contracts? That's new. You know, a few years ago, five years ago, it wasn't that way. I just hire you to go ahead and do this part for my company. If you think it's still there, you're being naive. What third parties providers are doing is they're essentially extending your perimeter, especially when you give them uh, access to your data and systems. And so there, there are different kinds of third parties. There's the infrastructure providers like cloud services and SaaS based services, but there's also contractors that you may allow onto your network. And so you'll, you'll need different policies for those. Uh, but I think the key back to the earlier point is that if you think of your data as your perimeter, look and see who has access to your data, right? Um, and how can you monitor that and be able to take responsive actions when it's been improperly accessed or if it's beginning to leave uh, your uh, virtual perimeter? The, the, the paradigm is shifting, right? And so as a result, we need to shift our thinking as well. So instead of it being more of professional services or us trying to get other folks to like f vendors who are nimble, for example, to adopt, you know, a information security policy or build better information. I think it's easier if we inverse this operation, we should have them push their logic to our, you know, data instead and operate locally within our bounds instead of having them, you know, and, and you said we're extending the perimeter by letting that data leave our perimeter, right? And so what, what if we can inverse this operation or even in the way, you know, like we have decoys for 
you know, um, uh, assets, why don't we have decodes for data, right? Canary tokens or things where we could potentially have first detection on, you know, where if the data is leaked, you know, uh, the others, for example, VGS is experimenting with something called ephemeral data, where data will have a self-destruction policy uh, on it. And so the only way it could do that is, you know, to even use the data it has to home phone back home. And ideally, the enterprise there that's sharing that data is the one that's responsible for making the decision of, like, you know, allow or deny, right. And so that's, that's the really interesting part is going to come up with different ways of trying to say, okay, instead of letting our data leave, and kind of managing all the different endpoints that the data is leaving, why don't we just bring their logic to our systems instead? And cloud computing is letting that happen today, especially with serverless runtimes and things like that. But I think if we inverse that, we'll be able to get a much better handle on you know being able to make sure data is protected from unauthorized access or compromise. And so that we think that's the future of where the world's going to be trending. Every every situation is, is unique, right? We have to look at what it, what it is they're doing, how they're going to be engaging with us, what the possible ramifications of that are, right? I mean, for, you know, we've, we've talked about IoT. I mean, medical devices are like a critical thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, if something goes wrong, you're not just dealing with, you know, a cyber attack. You could be dealing with loss of life scenarios. You could be dealing with things that have massive liability. I mean, I, I don't know what's more, li brings more liability than loss of life, right? And and you got to determine, um, and this is this is this is this is bringing it closer to the business, right? This is not Joey's decision as a CISO. This is sitting down with the C-suite and sometimes even the board and saying, "Look, this is the path that we're trying to go down as a business. Here are the potential pitfalls and things that are gonna that are gonna come." You know, we have to be a little bit forward thinking to be able to be successful, right? Because there's there's a whole lot of cliffs that we can hit, and understanding, hey, if, if we're you know, I'm not the one to make up. You can have it good, fast, or cheap, right? You, get, you can't get all three. You can get two. Um, and so if the business really wants to move fast and they say they want to do this in a competitive fashion, it's like, well, you know, the faster you drive the car, the more risk you take. Uh, that's just the nature of the beast. And if, and, and if we're trying to do that with new solution providers or new technologies, you know, you're just kind of compounding the risk that you're taking on. And, it, and is the outcome really worth that, right? And I think that that's what ends up driving a lot of decisions because because the notion is, I mean, you, you you can't eliminate all the risk, nor should you necessarily try to, right? You just have to understand what it is and, and what things you, you can take on more risk with and what things you cannot, right? I think that when we're talking about life-saving devices, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the liability is really high. I mean, that's negligent to take on that kind of risk in those kind of environments. There are other areas where we can have, you know, a theoretical analytics partner and we say, okay, maybe we need to move really fast, but do we really need to use real data to do this? Can we just not use completely like dummy anonymized data that looks and feels real, but is not real to prove out the use case and then and then have the discussion about using real data later. So, you know, there's ways to get around it, but it's just, you know, you got to be engaged with the business and understand kind of where that where that tie point is. And sometimes we've looked and said, you know, in order to do this, we're going to need so much from this vendor and the vendor comes back and says, look, look, we're small. What you're effectively asking us to do for the controls that you need put in are going to like they're going to be, they're going to cost us more than the revenue we would even make from you. But, um, you know, that's where we have the contract discussion and say, okay, well, how about this? How about we get to like a POC point where we can prove it. And then over time we can talk about the revenue model or something to kind of help you guys get some of the stuff you need in, or sometimes maybe we'll subsidize it. If we got a bunch of technology, it might cost us nothing to give them 300 licenses for something or whatever, whatever the case may be, or, or host some of the dev environment for them or whatever we need to do. So they're all different, you know? I want to follow the privacy thread that Rebecca and Mamou were going down. What's in store for data privacy in an advanced technology world? We've got CCPA, GDPR, more regulations coming. What is their likely impact on sensitive data safety? I think it's uh, clear that in many uh, industries, there's additional regulations and compliance is coming out specifically to address those concerns around data privacy. The same thing is true for data sovereignty in different countries. And I think as we move to a uh, cloud first world, um, we're going to have to be extremely careful about how we move data around and who gets access to that data. Um, so I think this is a, a, a ch another challenge to the traditional security monitoring network. There's no doubt that we need more and more data today 
to begin to understand what's going on. And we need models that allow us to uh, work on that data without necessarily storing that data. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a little bit of a business challenge to be frank and a technical challenge. Like how do we collect data in a way that allows us to preserve the privacy? That's a technical challenge, right? And how do we build models on that data without having to uh, store that data, right? And retention periods might be one way of addressing this, but uh, that, that's a great question uh, that I think we all need to, to work on answers to, to, to satisfy these mutual concerns. As a consumer, yeah, I'm, fe I'm fearful. I'm very fearful and you should be fearful out there. Uh, one of the things that happened during COVID is a lot of people, because health, health being first, went lax on a lot of, lot of their, um, I would say stop gaps and checking in on people, HIPAA and people like that. Hey, are you using some of the bigger name companies so we can feel a little bit comfortable that and assuming that you'll use it right. Therefore, we'll go ahead and allow you to get into telemedicine, we'll allow you to be going ahead and doing all these tests and everything else. So you have all this sensitive data for the greater good, right? It's, it's the first time. However, not everybody obviously was doing the, the, the right thing during those times. And now we're seeing, even again today, where we're finding out that a lot of people are getting their information compromised. Um, I, I think that's scary. I, I've always been a person who said is literally let me go ahead and opt in to being shared, not automatically sharing. And then when you talk about going back to 5G, now it can be shared in a nanosecond across the world. So one thing is consumers, what I very much so say that you need to do is you need to go ahead and if you haven't already, you need to take ownership. You need to take ownership and seeing who you are actually gonna do business with. And then you need to be reading those terms of service. You have to be reading those privacy policies. Who can they share that information with? And if you don't like it, don't do business with them. You need to assume that your, your data is gonna get out to other people, that they're gonna be sharing that data with other people. And then you also assume that you're going to have to have cleanup. So already partner with someone who obviously can go ahead and be monitoring that kind of stuff for you. Go ahead and get on do not call list. Go ahead and get a do not share list. I'll tell you, they're going to do it anyway. But you have to be proactive in protecting your data. Google yourself. Get yourself off. That's the main thing that I see too. I Google myself all the time and I'm like, who are all these new sites who just popped up again and I have to get myself up? And even if you go, there's some brokers out there you can broker with um, who will go ahead and try and monitor for that, but they never go ahead and watch for everything. You literally have to be the protector of yourself. People are making $300 to $600 off of you as a general rule, every single site that you go ahead and give your information to. Come up with, with other email addresses, come up with other ways to go ahead and get some information that you want to, but you got to take it proactively. And then when you talk about CCCPA, um, and then when you talk about GDPR, use the right to be deleted. Um, go ahead and, and go, go ahead and get that out and start getting your names out of these databases. But it's only going to become bigger. And next year, 2021, I think you're going to see a lot of this come even more to fruition. What we keep happening around the world is people keep trying to piecemeal privacy. We really have to get to a global privacy policy, a global accepted way of doing things. We need to be able to get to a global way for people to go ahead and have the right to be forgotten. And then even when you say the right to be forgotten, you can't just go ahead and bombard companies with 100,000, 10,000, even 1,000, just get me off your list and you guys go figure it out. That's not holistically for the company either. And it's kind of hard to determine what you need for time resources to actually be able to do that. And then it leads us back again to properly being able to tag data. As soon as you get data in, which regulations are all those going to be responsible for? So it's, it's really 2020 has been a perfect storm for a lot of stuff for, for us from security and privacy and compliance and risk management. The conversations that we've been trying to happen over the years, it's allowed us to have open those conversations up. But I tell people 2021 and 2022 are going to be the year really to watch. Um, you're not going to see as big of um, changes in those lines in 2020. 2020 is more like, oh, yeah, you guys were being serious. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting when you look at the complexity of kind of, like you said, like your personal data, right? People would joke around and say, you know, the good thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. The problem is with the difference of privacy standards, you don't get to choose. You just have to adhere to all of them and they can even be conflicting, right? And so, you know, when, when, when you're, as an organization, it's, it's a struggle because if you can give me the request to say, delete my data and, and every aspect of it that you had, 
from the time that I engaged with you. That's ultimately the ask, right? But then somewhere that went to a third party who went to another third party who went to another third party and probably a lot of times for very valid use cases, right? I mean, maybe I had to route something to a claims adjuster and I had to route something out to a pharmacy and I had to route something. And then at some point your accountability for that end. But, but really at the end of the day, in my mind, it didn't. I, I did business with you. I gave you some aspect of my personal data and my expectation of you is that you're able to pull that back. And, and the reality of it is that's not realistic today. I mean, I think if we get to a point in a utopian you know, society in my brain where everybody had their own personal blockchain and could control their own data elements and who, you know, when I go to the dentist, they get this. And when I go to the store, they get that. But, you know, we're not, we're not there today. Uh, it takes us a while to get there. But I mean, if you really think about it, for every one of us, there's a 4D footprint of who we are, a digital footprint, right? You could take your passport and your social security card and all that stuff and throw it out the window because I can still, I mean, figure out who you know, where you eat, what, what your religious preferences are, you know, what time you go to bed, who your friends are, who knocked on your doorbell last night. I mean, that's all out there. I think it's a super important point because we have both just discussed, you know, you folks just discussed effectively a user experience problem, right? And so this is going to, this is starting to happen. Companies like do not pay that are starting to have one click data access or one click fight, you know, uh, a, you know, really exercise my rights. I think it's going to cause a lot of, you know, burden on folks to be able to understand how to be able to combat these things. And, you know, the ultimate thing is going to be a user. Once folks start to realize their rights, just like we have companies like Ernie or Capital One's Paribus, which gives me refunds on price drops, because that's what, you know, when I sign up for a credit card and the price drops, they can do, they can exercise a price match. And these are now done automatically for me. Imagine if I could do that with all the different rights and exercising them with one click. And I think that's a user experience problem. Among the challenges that are going to shape our organizations in 2021 and beyond are new threats to card payment systems and other financial transactions. So my question for each of you as we wrap up this conversation, how do we address and prevent the exploitation of vulnerabilities across all these transaction platforms? Rebecca, you got us started before. How about if you help wrap us up as well? Payment card and transactions. I think one of the, the challenges holistically really in any of them is the vulnerability management. And, and how quickly vulnerabilities come out and how quickly you need to try and patch all your systems, you know, globally, worldwide. And, and then doing that from a risk perspective, because what are you going to patch one, one? I think that is the greatest one. And one of the things is because, you know, Joey's on the line here in healthcare is we did go have and, and have the first patient in, in Germany go ahead and die because of a ransomware attack. You know, that was over, you know, a vulnerability within Citrix, the VPN. And so they went to the hospital and the hospital had been taken down ransomware and they had to go ahead and then take them 30 kilometers away and they didn't make it in transport. So we have the first negligent homicide um, that is actually going to be on the books if they can go ahead and, and, and catch people on there. So, I, you know, when you talk about payment card and you talk about 5G and you know, everything else, and, and it's really vulnerability management is going to be critical. Um, and how do, how do we really, you know, it's getting to us almost like you have to try and patch in real time constantly all the time. So I think that is like one number one critical, I think, um, right now is, is one thing that, that uh, keeps me up at night is, is trying to see how we're going to do that when things are 100 times faster. And then you're going to be wanting me to try and patch 100 times faster globally. It's like the old old T-shirt or, or, or poster that says, you know, coffee, make decisions, make bad decisions faster with worse impacts or something. It's, it's kind of the same thing, right? Like here comes 5G, here comes quantum computing. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, we, we, use, we use the analogy before, just like, you know, the stopgap is gone. It's just, just, just this huge open pipe now. And so theoretically, you know, the, the landscape um, just extends broadly, almost infinitely. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the target space is still fairly static, right? I mean, the, from, from an adversarial perspective, you got a way bigger weapon to shoot at a way smaller target. Um, and so, you know, that the, 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 it's kind of diminishing returns for us in that capacity. But um, the other challenge is that it's, it's not a single ecosystem yet, right? It, it, it's disparate and it's, and, it's, and it's fractal and it's kind of fragmented all over the place. And so just the nature of that, right? Just that kind of tectonic plate nature of it makes it very, very difficult I mean, the ask is ultimately, how do you seal the cracks in something that is inherently and permanently cracked? 
when it comes to card payment systems, obviously we see this a lot in uh, uh, retail and kiosks. And uh, interesting enough, a lot of retail is, fran is a franchise model as well. So you have additional challenges as a CISO of not really having ownership or control over your franchisee's uh, IT infrastructure, let alone security. And so I, I think it goes back to some of the themes of, of this uh, conversation, which is getting visibility across the enterprise, understanding you know, these new uh, points of vulnerability. So we talked about 5G earlier, right? And how that expands uh, the landscape. Uh, you know, Credit card swipes is, is another example of that, understanding these vulnerabilities. Uh, taking an adversarial view to, to see what adversaries see, see the vulnerabilities they can exploit. And then again, being able to connect the dots, you know, to say uh, these vulnerabilities times these exploits, uh, given, these vulner uh, given this landscape means you're likely to get hit. And how can I contain that? How can I detect it? And how can I respond to it fast? And that's why we do think uh, an overall XDR approach which brings us together in a single picture, allows you to not only see, but also to take decisive action is, is imperative. And just to wrap that up, I think these are all great suggestions. Ultimately, it comes down to collaborating, right? And so there's going to be threat intelligence feeds. There's threat intelligence feeds right now and an open standard for that. I think ultimately to be able to join disparate systems that are emanating this kind of data, uh, in order to avoid exploitations for them, we're going to need to be monitoring them across different systems. And so as a result, that will require a secure mechanism of being able to collaborate and securely share information so that other folks, for example, those like Joey, who are saving lives, get defer, you know, they're the first folks to find out if something might potentially be going on in, a, in an adjacent vertical. And so I think what we're seeing is the globalization of, you know, exploitation, right, and vulnerabilities. And so that's that's what's happening right now. And as we get more and more connected, it's very clear that that's obviously a side effect of it is that we're going to see a, you know, a global theme that's underlying. It's going to allow folks to exploit uh, these assets to their own, um, for their own advantage. And ultimately, our goal is to be able to combat them with just better decision making. And so the, the, the more collaboration, secure information sharing is going to be very, very important in the future. Pam, I want to thank you very much for your time and your insights. They've been very engaging. So Rebecca, Anu, Mahmoud, Joey, thanks so much for being with me today. Thank you so much for paying attention again. This has been our cybersecurity leadership series. We didn't scare you today. You weren't listening. <laughs> we didn't inspire you that we didn't communicate effectively. For Information Security Media Group, I'm Tom Field. Thank you so much for paying attention to us today.